<laughs> All right, everybody. How are you guys doing? Kate and Melier, Eddie sounds funny. I don't know what that means. All right. Um, we have one question going into it today. And I'm open to take your other call, your other calls, your other questions. Um, and we'll see how it goes today. All right. Um, when, so let, let's talk about the first question. Uh, someone, so I have a friend in South Africa, Leonard. Oops, that's my mouse. Huh. Oh, Anthony says, hi, Eddie, it's Anthony. How are you? I'm doing good, Anthony. How are you doing? I'm just a little tired. <laughs> I did a long walk today. I think probably about seven miles. Hello, Gabriel. Gabriel. Anyway, so I have a friend in South Africa named Leonard, and he has a student that um, is having headaches. And in fact, I took notes. Let me read from my notes. He's getting headaches associated with trumpet playing. And, you know, the thing is, there's people out there, and I, I've talked about this on this the, on these Q&As before, there's people out there that have automatic knee-jerk answers for every question, right? And one of those automatic knee-jerk answers for the when you get headaches is um, that you need to relax more. And I just don't. That's only partially true, and we've talked in, in this, in the Q&As before about how disastrous that adv advice can be. Uh, we haven't talked about it a lot, but we have talked about it a little bit. The whole relaxation thing is untargeted. And I actually have a student right now that's going through an embouchure adjustment, and I'm convinced that the reason he's got to go through that embouchure adjustment is because he listened to the people who were saying to relax. Okay? So, um, so let's talk about my stance on why what causes the headaches and what you can do about it. We're going to do this a little bit backwards. We're going to talk first about what you can do about it. Okay. Um, if you get headaches associated with, with playing your trumpet, first of all, what I want to tell you is that if you already are prone to headaches, trumpet playing is going to make it worse. Okay. And, you know, I had a... The worst headaches I ever had in my whole life, I had a gig with this salsa singer, famous salsa singer. If you look up Canario uh, on, on YouTube, a lot of his videos come up, if I'm not mistaken. He's famous because not only does he sing salsa, but he'll do this and whistle, right? And that's why they call him Canario, right? Canary. Um, uh, and, but it sounds like when he's whistling, it sounds like it's a flute. That's why he's doing his fingers like this. It, it sounds like a flute, and it sounds like very advanced jazz flute. And I played with him, I guess it's got to be about 1991, 1992. And I went into that gig already with a, a bad headache. And... So, which is odd for me. I hardly, in my whole life, I've hardly ever had headaches. But, and I don't remember what happened that night. All I remember is that I had a headache going into the gig. It wasn't caused by the trumpet, but, and I was okay when I was playing. But I would play a phrase and then just, like, almost collapse 
because the pain was so bad and, and the deeper into the gig it got, the more unbearable, unbearable the pain was. Now, obviously, this is, you know, one of the reasons I teach the way I teach is because when stuff goes wrong, if you practice the way I teach you to practice, when stuff goes wrong, you can still do well. And apparently, I played so well that night that the piano player, who I had not met yet at the time, his name is Gilbert Cedeno, um, he was so impressed with my playing that when an opportunity came to be member of another band, uh, he thought of me, and I got hired, and I, it was the best band up till that I had ever played with up to that point. But my point is that on that gig, uh, those tremendous headaches did not stop me from doing my job. And I just wanted to point that out, that when you practice a certain way, and there are certain conventions that I follow when I practice, um, you don't stuff like headaches aren't going to make you sound worse. Anyway, so I have some things written here. One thing, and, and this wasn't originally my idea. It's, it's something that I had known about. And then I mentioned this to, to my wife and, and she said, well, what about people wearing masks? If you're already doing something that's going to create headaches in the first place, Playing the trumpet over and above that is going to make the headaches worse. So uh, I know that South Africa is still in lockdown now. And if you're out, I think you're probably supposed to um, wear masks. And I'm not. So one of the points I'm going to make in, in this is to say that I can't know what's making anybody have a headache. Nobody can know that. Okay. But this is something to consider. If you've been wearing a mask, because we know that masks make, give you headaches anyway because they raise your, your blood carbon dioxide levels, right? So uh, wearing a mask will make you have headaches to begin with. And then if you go and play trumpet over and above that, it can be what pushes you over the edge, and now you're getting headaches. So that's definitely something to consider. Now, before we talk about what causes the headaches, let's talk about what the answer is. It just so happens that all the stuff that gives you a bad sound is the same stuff that will cause you to have a headache. Let that sink in. So the same advice that I would give you to have a better sound is the, the advice I would give you to um, not get headaches when you're, when you're playing the trumpet. So then what advice is that? Number one is to listen. And you would, you know, I know that the younger students, when I say this, they roll their eyes, right? If you don't know what a good sound sounds like, you can't produce a good sound. Now, on the surface, it may look, it may seem like listening to trumpet music, listening to great trumpet music, how is that going to help you not get a headache? And it's not going to help you in the short term. But, you know, one of the things we're looking at is, you know, what's going to happen in the long term. And if you want the headaches to eventually go away, the listening is going to help because it, and we'll, we'll talk later about why, but it's the same stuff that gives you a, a better sound is the same stuff that gets you the, the headache to go away. Okay. Um, so here's some more practical answers. Oh, what did I write here? So, what I want to do is, is, is stress that these are practical solutions. You know, a lot of the stuff that people will tell you about how to get the headaches to go away is not practical. And I'm not pitting myself against them. I've heard this stuff. I know it doesn't work, okay? They will say, relax this and relax that. 
problem with that is those are just words and what does that mean to you? Right? What exactly are you doing to relax this and relax that? Um, you could think that you are relaxed or that you're not relaxed and it doesn't the 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 rhetorical connection is not there okay so we're not making that connection so these are practical things you can do that will make the the headache go away okay listening i already talked about that three levels of rest okay i teach that you should rest three different ways right and if you haven't watched my three levels of rest video, I strongly recommend it. Um, just type in the into uh, YouTube, type Eddie Lewis, three levels of rest, and it will take you there. The three levels of rest, probably the most important thing you can do to make your headaches go away in, in the short term. The three levels of rest are probably the most important thing, okay? And it's also going to help you get a better sound. What else do I have here? Lip bends, okay? Lip bends, because with the lip bends, you're learning how to control your aperture. Now, what is a lip bend? Lip bend is when you play the note and bend it down one half step or a whole step. The ones I did today... I like these ones, they're not published yet, but you start on, let's say, for example, G, F sharp down, back to G, then F natural, then back to G, then F sharp, and then back to G. I like these lip bends. those a lot um and that's going to help you with with the things that make the headache go away okay same thing with pedal tones by the way pedal do pedal tones do the same thing but in a uh, uh just in a different way so we want pedal tones and then the last thing i'm going to say is because a lot of times people get headaches because they're trying to play higher than what they should so um, I would also then recommend my one range book, okay? Because the one range book tells you how to develop your range without going past those notes that are going to make you have a headache. If you're doing the one range concept, you're not going to get headaches, okay? Now let's talk quickly about why you get headaches the reason you get headaches is because the balance between the air and the resistance is off. Usually the headaches come from having too much air and too much resistance. It's got to be a balance, right? So if you do more air, you need to pull off on the, the resistance. And what is resistance? This is where the this is where the people that say you have to relax, relax this and you have to relax that. This is where they get it wrong. Okay? This is where they get it wrong because there's different sources of resistance. So if it, it, so let's say one of the ones people talk about is the neck. You have to relax your neck. Well, that's not the only place that you can have bad resistance. It's one of the places. You might just be using too much pressure and that creates more resistance here. All right, so um, so it's a balance of resistance. The more resistance you have, the less air you have to use. The more, the less resistance you have, the more air you have to use. Okay, and so where the headaches come from is when you use too much. And yes, if that resistance is coming in your neck, then you have to relax the neck. But that's the reason that's not good enough is because, first of all, nobody can tell where your personal resistance problems are. Nobody can. That's not possible. Whether they look at you, they, they hear your sound, nobody can tell you that. 
Nobody, I'm going to stress that, no one can tell you where your resistance is out of balance. That has to be you, and it has to be subconscious, not conscious. Okay? That's my take on that. Um, now, one of the things that, that you can do to see if I'm right about this as a test, because you can't, you can't do this when you're playing, like in a performance or something, but one way you can do to, um, to check this is to just play softer and see if you still get the headaches. If you play soft and you're still getting headaches, then this is probably something else and has nothing to do with your trumpet playing. That's how I see it. Um, anyway, I think that's all the notes that I took. So I hope this, so the, the, the student in South Africa, his name is Victor. And I hope this helps Victor. He's probably going to watch it tomorrow because it's like 1, 1 a.m. over there right now. <laughs> right? 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, so he'll probably be watching this in the morning. All right. So let's get on with the other questions. I hope that helps. Um, with Clark Studies, this is from Anthony. With Clark Studies, must you do the studies in order like Clark suggested. I don't think so. I don't do them that way. I like to go through the whole book in one key. That's my, if you want to apply, so the totalization studies are a, a group of uh, scale studies that are based on the tonalization concept. The tonalization concept can be applied to other stuff. If you want to do any book, Clark, Arbin, anything, um, with the tonalization concept, you do everything in the book in one key first, and then go back to the beginning of the book and do it in another key. You know, there's somebody that did this, and I don't think this influenced me, but now that I'm looking back, there is a book that does this. Um, I remember paying for a book. You know, I never had a lot of money, right? So for me to buy a book and find out it's all the same material as a book I had already had, purchased that was that actually made me angry but um there's a so i had already bought ernest s williams's routine book uh daily drills or something like that technical studies or whatever it's called um my concept of what a routine is came from that book and then later i bought the the routine book by john haney and john haney's book was almost identical to the the Ernest S. Williams book, but rearranged so that it was in, so that the keys went together, which is very interesting. I hope I'm not remembering this wrong, but that's how I remember it. So yes, no, you don't have to do them in order at all. And he says, I was doing study one, and then he says, you must master one before you do two. Oh, so, you know, I, I, I agree with that to an extent, right? If you're going to do his method, um, whatever order you do it in, you should master the one you're on before you go to another one. But I don't think necessarily that means that you have to do them in that order. Uh, Anthony says that the three levels of rest is a great video. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so, I hope that answers your question, Anthony. Um, so I have a different take on the, the whole perfection thing. I like the word master here. Perfection isn't obtainable, right? When I see a graph in my head, perfection has a little infinity sign on the top. And it, it causes all kinds of psychological nonsense in your head. Um, so mastering is a, a different thing. So mastering is 
a, a degree of confidence that you have. You've done it right a hundred times. You know you're going to do it right the hundred and first time. To me, that's what mastering is. I don't believe in doing things wrong in the first place. I think you should take every care that you can possibly take and do stuff right from the beginning. Don't make any mistakes ever. Of course, that's not that's not physically possible, but if you strive for that, your playing is going to improve tremendously. Uh, Gabriel says, he asks, can we do reverse lip bends? There's a reason why we don't go up, and it's because each note has a, uh, a ceiling, and so we can, we can always bend down. Bending up, we hit this ceiling, and if we bend too far up, we pop up into the next note. So I remember when I was in college, we experimented with that to see just how much we could bend the note to get it before it popped to the next note. It's not far. It's not far. Um, now, let me tell you this. There are some instruments that, that don't have slots. And, you know, there's people that say when it comes to buying a trumpet, oh, yeah, yeah, I like this horn. It really slots well. Um, that's not necessarily such a good thing. I, I think there's a spectrum of instruments I have a student that has one horn. He's he's an adult student, so he, he buys a lot of different trumpets, right? He's got this one horn where the slot is about this wide, <laughs> right? You can bend it up, you can bend it down. And and the problem, right, with, with a, a instrument that doesn't slot that much is that it's almost impossible to play in tune. Okay, so what I prefer is something that slots somewhere in the middle, it gives me enough wiggle room that I can play in tune, but not so much wiggle room that there's no center to the note. Okay? So, but yes, there's a reason why we don't don't bend up. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, go up instead of going down. Right. So, um, hello, Richard. Nice to see you. Um, so... Caden says that I sound funny. Um, are you talking about my accent? <laughs> you know, I had a, I did my very first video on Facebook the other day. And um, the guy says, I'm trying to, 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 to place your accent. And I told him it was Heinz 57. <laughs> They used to have, I don't know if they even have Heinz 57 sauce anymore, but um, Heinz 57 was basically a sauce that had 57 different ingredients in it, secret ingredients, I guess. And um, so I've lived all over the world. Uh, I lived on the East Coast. Well, first place I lived in, you know, when I was old enough to hear people talking was in Germany. I think it was Stuttgart that where we lived. Um, lived in Stuttgart until I was two years old, somewhere around there. Then we lived on the east coast of the United States for a long time, up and down the coast, by the way, not in one area. We were up and down the coast. And then for junior high, I lived in Hawaii, bro. Right? And then... Um, Back to El Paso. I say back to El Paso. There was one short period when we lived in El Paso. That's when my parents bought a house. Um, back to El Paso for college and uh, and um, and high school. And then I moved to from there. I moved to Chicago and Pittsburgh and ended up finally here in Houston. I've been in Houston for, so all of that influence never went away. So there's times when my accent just goes in all these different directions. Sometimes I sound like a Southerner, <laughs> y'all. Sometimes I sound like I'm from, you know, there's this, there's this woman that I buy valve oil from, 
from upstate New York. No, I think she's more like from the Rochester area. And I was on the phone with her placing my order and she says, where are you from? You don't sound like a Texan. And I told her I, a, a little bit about this, but my father is from the Pittsburgh area. And she goes, that's the accent that I hear. Some, so sometimes I sound like I'm from Western Pennsylvania. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that's what you mean by I sound funny. Maybe I sound funny as a trumpet player. <laughs> and if you, if that's what you're saying, then I just don't even care. <laughs> right. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Do you think it's, this is from Gabriel. Do you think it's better to change pitch with more air support and firm embouchure or control the aperture making it smaller? I think all of that should be natural and not mechanical. I don't think you should ever, um, you, I don't think you should ever be, um, consciously aware of that when you're playing. You can do exercises, like this is what the lip bends are, right? The lip bends are when you manipulate that. That's what the pedal tones are. Pedal tones are when you manipulate those factors that you're talking about, okay? And the reason why we do, do those exercises, same thing also for that matter, same thing with the mouthpiece buzz and the lip buzz, okay? The reason we do those things is so that our subconscious mind has more material to work with. So that when, and if you couple, if you couple those exercises with listening a lot, listening to a lot of great music, then what happens, and I understand that this sounds a lot like the Arnold Jacobs stuff uh, what's he call that school of thought? It's song and wind. I think there's a, some distinct differences between what I teach and what the song and wind people teach. And one of those things is that, that relaxation thing. And I don't have a problem with the concept of relaxation. I have a huge problem with the rhetoric. I have a huge problem with the rhetoric because the students aren't picking it up the way we mean it. Right, so that's why I'm very careful about the about what we do. I hope that makes sense. I'm very careful about what we do, and 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 not try to be so verbal about everything. So yes, you want to do stuff that gives you control over those aspects. But when you're actually playing, and by the way, I have this thing that I teach that I call the fifty percent rule. And part of the reason why I teach the 50% rule is because of this, what we're talking about. You know, when, when we're playing music, there, we're supposed to be thinking about as many as 50 different things. And I don't mean consciously thinking. There's stuff that we're doing correctly when we're playing right, right? When we're playing correctly, there, we're doing in order to play correctly, there's about 50 different things we need to, our mind needs to do to play correctly when we're playing music. That's not true when we play exercises. And this is why I say it's so important to do at least 50% of your time, your practice time needs to be music. And what happens, I believe, is when you spend more time practicing music and and less time practicing exercises, even though, you know, I. I Part of the living that I make, part of my income is selling those exercises, right? And I'm still outspoken about not only ever doing exercises because the exercises are worthless if you don't, uh, the exercises are worthless if you don't hand all of that control over to your subconscious mind. And that's what happens when we practice music. 
That's what happens with music because you can't possibly do all that stuff at the same time without uh, delegating, so to speak, the those tasks to the subconscious mind. That's why people, you know, I've noticed this from a long time ago. I had a friend who had a amazing warm-up that he did every day. It was amazing. And you, you're you actually starting to think when you're listening to him, this guy must be one of the best trumpet players in the whole world. And then he starts playing music. And it's awful. And I, he, he's actually one of the people who helped me discover this concept. How could somebody have such an amazing routine that they do every day, and then when they play music, it sounds awful? How is that possible? It's because when you're playing exercises, you don't have to do 50 things at once. That's why. So if all you ever do is practice exercises, the music comes up, and you become basically crippled. Musically crippled because you that part of your brain that's supposed to do that automatically isn't working. It's not you never turned it on. Right? So that's that's why practicing music is so important. Anyway, um Anthony says I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and now I have been in Houston for five years. Wow, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. You know, I I I've told you before that the that the, the the Anthony's and the Tony's get I get them mixed up sometimes, um, but there's a I think another one of the maybe not necessarily from Brooklyn but another one of the Anthony's is also in New York. So Richard says, "How do you know if your mouthpiece is big or small?" I played a Bobby Shoe jazz mouthpiece, but went back to the Box Seven CW. Okay. For now, the way I pick a mouthpiece in terms of diameter, the, the diameter that I go with, I, I base it entirely on comfort. And we don't even, when, when, when we're looking for the diameter, we don't even blow on the mouthpiece. We just put it on the lips and let it sit there and ask ourselves, how does that feel? If it's not comfortable, we want something that feels comfortable. I hope that makes sense. It's not musical. It, it has 100% to do with, with the structure of your teeth. Now, I've had students that we could go bigger sizes, smaller sizes, and it all just feels the same to them. Well, then I think you just go with, you know, whatever's in the middle of the road, and that would be like a 7C. Seven, a seven uh, now, see, CW is, has a wide rim, and that might be something that... Um, so here's what happens with the wide rim. Wide rim gives you more endurance, but the, you pay a, a price for that. Wide rim gives you more endurance, but you pay a price. And, and I, I've, I've not, I'm not an expert on this. Um, I'm not an expert on anything, but, <laughs> but um, I don't even know why I, I said that. I don't, I don't even believe in experts. <laughs> but um, um, I don't have as much experience with the mouthpieces because I just don't like playing with them so much. So for me, it's largely theoretical. Um, but my understanding is that the wide rims take away your, your flexibility. It gives you higher endurance, but less flexibility. Now, less flexibility has its trade-offs too, right? I mean, yes, we, we would like to be more flexible, but it also helps you not to crack so many notes. So, the, but here's the problem, right? If you don't need the wide rim and you're just using it as a um, security blanket, because it can, the wide rim can be very 
comforting, right? The wide rim can actually be, um, a, 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 I, I use the word already, security blanket. It can be like that, okay? So um, anyway. Um, but that might be, I guess what I'm saying is that might become uh, complicating your search for the, for the mouthpiece sizes. Now, if you, here's the thing though, if you like the 7CW and it works for you, there's no need to get a different mouthpiece just because someone said something or whatever. I don't know why you would look, you know, if that, if you come back to 7CW, like in this case, right? The Bobby Shoe Jazz mouthpiece. Ooh, I've never even touched one of those mouthpieces. Okay, I'm I'm one of those people that it doesn't mean anything to me if you put some famous person's name on the equipment. In fact, chances are I won't trust that that equipment. That the that you see what I'm saying? How do I know they didn't just put that name on there just to sell it? Right? So I don't trust stuff like that. That's just my personality, though. Um, Anthony says, I didn't think I had a Brooklyn accent, but I noticed <laughs> in my virtual recital last week, I have a terrible accent. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with a Brooklyn accent as far as I'm concerned. Nothing wrong. And you know what? I was in Brooklyn for, I guess, three days. Um, 2000, I think it was the year 2000. What a beautiful place, huh? What a, I even wrote a poem. I'll have to dig it up for you one day. That was back when I was writing poetry. And I have a, a short poem that I wrote about Brooklyn because at first, at first when I got to Brooklyn, I'm like, oh, these people in such a small spot, <laughs> right? I'm like, I, 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 I was almost frantic, you know, because I'm not used to that many people. Um, but that when that, that panicky feeling dissipated, it was like I was home. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, the, the Brooklyn area is so, such a welcoming place. At least it was to me. Now we were, we were visiting family that lived like a few blocks away from the, that one bridge, the, the, the bridge that's, I guess, the, the most southern bridge. We were only a few blocks away from that. Um, but yeah, I, I remember feeling, and, and it surprised me too, right? Because it was like my first time ever experiencing people in New York and everyone always told me what a what jerks people in New York were and stuff like that and it was actually the complete opposite it was a complete opposite I think some of the nicest people I've met in a long time up to that point in my life were were there in 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 Brooklyn so um yeah I like Brooklyn and I I, I don't have any problem with a Brooklyn accent uh all right so Richard says is just a matter of trial and error. Yes, I do think it's okay. So no, I, I yes, you have to do trial and error, but it's not just trial and error. I think you have. What I strongly recommend is that you record everything. Each mouthpiece has different components, right? So you have the the rim diameter, and and usually when we talk about rim diameter, we're talking about the inner diameter. Okay, the inside diameter. Then you have um, the 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 rim shape. I guess you would call that. And in your case, you're using a wide rim, and um, that would be one of those components. Then you have the the cup. We have cup shape, and we have cup depth. Then we have the throat. How big the throat is. And I saw a conversation recently. That whether the, the throat is conical or cylindrical actually makes a difference. Um, me, personally, I haven't actually experimented with that. I've experimented tiny bits with opening throats. 
I don't think on modern equipment, so like if you buy, just buy a regular Bach mouthpiece, you might want to experiment with opening the throat. Um, on new mouthpieces like from custom makers, we still call them custom even even though you buy the, like, it's almost like buying a Bach now. You just order the size you want, right? But we still call those custom mouthpieces because they're not as impersonal, I guess. I don't know. Um, but those, I don't recommend opening those, the throat for that. And then the last thing is the, 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 the backbone of the, of the mouthpiece. So all of these things contribute in different ways. The most important are the, the, the inner diameter and the cup shape and the cup the cup uh, depth. A deeper cup is is a very different mouthpiece from a shallow cup. So it's not so. So I agree with you. Um, it is trial and error, but it's not just trial and error. You want to actually record what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Okay. Um, Gabriel says on mouthpiece. I think the most important thing is. The high point. So, what do you? Let me know what you mean by that. I don't. That's not something I'm a, I'm familiar with. What do you mean by high point? Um, Anthony says, "You are so right about exercises versus music." Because when I joined a community orchestra here, I had a challenge following the music that was basically easy. That's that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. I think I, oh, the thing I like about Houston is not crowded like Brooklyn, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh huh. Um, you know, I lived, I told you, as an adult, I lived in Chicago first, and then I lived in Pittsburgh. I, I, if I had a choice, I would have stayed in Pittsburgh, but when I was there, there were no jobs. Um, not music jobs. There weren't, there weren't, um, I couldn't even get a job at McDonald's. So I had to leave because there was just no work. Um, but I, so I lived in Chicago and I, there was no way I would live in Chicago. You know, we were, we were first in Skokie. And then from Skokie, we went and lived just down the street from Northwestern in Evanston, which was kind of nice, but it, it was just too big city for me. And Houston's not like that. It's getting more like that. It's definitely getting more like that. Oh, I see what you're saying. If you have any physical high point in your embouchure, that that's what I mean when 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 I say when you're when you're sizing mouthpieces, you kind of just make the embouchure, not a tight embouchure, just a, a comfortable embouchure. Place the mouthpiece on there and just feel if that feels comfortable or not. And so high point, low point, whatever, you're going to feel if something's not right. If something is uncomfortable, you're going to feel that. Okay? And that's, that's the first step. I think some people think that's nuts because it has nothing to do with playing the trumpet. But that thing's got to be on your face for hours and hours and hours and hours. It should feel comfortable. And you know what? When I first changed, when I first started choosing a mouthpiece this way, where I wanted it to feel comfortable, think about that, right? If it's not comfortable, think about what that's doing to you. If it's Now, maybe some people think, well, I'll get used to it. You don't get used to something like that. What you do is tolerate it. That's not the same thing. So that's why I say the first thing you do with the mouthpiece is put it on your lips. And is it comfortable? Does it hit all the sweet spots for you? I hope that makes sense. Um, that's right. Gabriel says, then you choose a bigger or smaller. You choose bigger or smaller. Now the problem is some of us can't don't have access to, to 
different sizes. I would love to have one of those, and 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 not okay. So don't get me wrong. I I wouldn't just have the kit. I know people do that. I would actually become a, a genuine if it was if I had the money to put into it. I would actually become a genuine. Um, even though I don't use their mouthpieces anymore, uh, maybe I would if I had the kit. What do you call it? Uh, Warburton. Because that, what a beautiful uh, educational tool to have all those different sizes of mouthpiece to work with and then interchange this and interchange that so that you have a way for the students to find what works for them. And the only reason I haven't done that yet is because I think the kit is like, I'm not, I don't remember, it's like $2,000 or something like that. And I don't know for sure. I think they have someone that already does it here in Houston. Um, but I don't know for sure if, uh, you know, if, if I could make my money back selling the mouthpieces here in Houston. But I'll tell you what I would do. I would be one of those guys that, that like a mouthpiece guru. If I had that kit, I would be a mouthpiece guru. And I would have people come over for free consultations, right? So that we could size them. That's what I would do. All right. Anyway, so um, so so this is Anthony. So pra practicing more music is the way to go. Yes, I, I actually believe that. Yes. I, you know, I say the minimum is 50%. It really should be more like 75%, but most people don't practice that much. You know, the routine, you should never have a routine that's more like two hours long. Right? So if you're going to have a practice day that's four, five, six hours long, then you should not be doing a, a three-hour routine. Right? Get the exercises done with and spend that. So like have an hour-long routine and then spend four hours practicing music. The problem is when, you know, some students, they only have like at the most an hour to practice a day. Some of them only 30 minutes to practice a day. That's why I wrote the Chops Express book. I wrote the Chops Express book so you could get all the benefits. Okay, not all the benefits, but most of the benefits of the routine. But in 15 minutes or less. That way, if you practice um, 45 minutes, you do 15-minute routine. And that's a 15, not 50. 15-minute routine and spend 30 minutes practicing music. That's ideal. That's wonderful. And, you know, I have some students that can only practice 15 minutes a day. And I have a special routine that I wrote for them that only takes about three or four minutes. So they practice three or four minutes on the exercises, and then they practice 10 minutes on the music. So you can, you know, gauge all this stuff according to what time you have. Um, Richard says, would it be worth to invest in a mouthpiece that is more expensive? Some companies claim that they have a bigger, uh, a better one developed with new technologies like Monet mouthpieces, but they are not cheap. Let me tell you about what, how I feel about that. If you don't already know what size you need, it doesn't matter what brand you get. You're still searching. And I don't think $200 mouthpieces are the way to search. A lot of people make that mistake. It's different if you already know that the size that you need, and, and I think it's best to know in terms of um, millimeters or, you know, uh, inches or whatever, know your exact size. 
because the different numbers from different brands are different, right? Um, I'm around 17 point, 17 and a quarter millimeters, I think. If It's been a long time since I've looked this up, but it's, I think that's where I'm at, about 17 and a quarter. I'm big. I play big equipment. And that's because of these teeth that stick out so bad. That's why I play on the equipment that I do. And it makes, I'll tell you what, because I, I do that, it makes playing hard, playing the high notes and all that stuff, it's more difficult for me because I'm playing on this huge mouth, a uh, huge bathtub of a mouthpiece. Um, so no, I would not spend, if you don't know what your size is yet, it takes time to find your size. I would not spend money on a very expensive mouthpiece until you know what your size is. Then when you know what your size is, you can experiment with the higher quality mouthpieces. And I do believe that they have higher quality, okay? I do think there are some things that make them better. But it, that's but it's not going to help you if if you're going to be on the wrong size mouthpiece. Doesn't matter what quality the mouthpiece is if you're on the wrong size for you. I hope that makes sense. Gabriel says, I think we have too much today. How how do they play 50 years ago? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point, right? That's a good point. You know, I have a friend who's always comparing the trumpet players, the jazz trumpet players today. He's a jazz player. Jazz trumpet players today, comparing them to people like Lee Morgan, Clifford Brown, uh, even Freddie Hubbard and those guys, right? Um, and he says, the, the guys today, they sound really, really good. But he says something is missing. And I have to believe there's, I, I don't think it's just one thing that's missing, but I have to believe the struggle with the equipment is one of those things, <laughs> right? I think making the equipment work no matter what, because that's what you've got. You know, those guys weren't wealthy. They couldn't do what a lot of these guys do today and buy, you know, a dozen trumpets and 200 different mouthpieces. I'm exaggerating, but man, I can't believe some of the equipment these people are buying today. Those guys back in the old days made it work. They made what they had work. So, yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, 1650s. You're talking about millimeters, I'm assuming. That, that's Gabriel. Is 1650 is a good average. Yes, I think that's about the size. I, I'm not, like I said, I, I don't have all those numbers memorized. Um, but it's good for you to know your own specs. That's always a good thing. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Richard. So, um, any other questions? All right. So, um, I guess we're going to be done then. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm tired too. <laughs> um, you know, next week we'll probably have a bunch of high school kids. That's what I'm, I'm anticipating. Must have been hard being a trumpet player in a band like Glenn Miller. I'm sure it was in the 40s. Did these guys go to college? I don't know about that. I don't think they did. I don't. I think the whole scene back then was entirely different. The idea of going to college for, for music... For that kind of music, maybe for the university, for, uh, uh, for orchestral stuff, maybe. But for as big band players, I don't think that was a thing back then. Right? Um, I might be wrong, but I, 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 that's the impression I get, that, that the whole jazz thing was that even if they did have it at the schools, it was underground. Right? They didn't want jazz in the schools. 
And so people would do, I heard stories about Chuck Manjohn, uh him and, and, and some of the other guys that, that you see on his albums, they would have uh, jazz band rehearsals down in the basement, um, secret. And um, yeah, so I don't, so I can't even imagine that in the 40s they went to college. Yeah. So um, I was going to say something. I forgot what it was. All right. Well, I guess we'll call it quits today. Oh, I was talking about the, the high school students last week, the, coming next week. The In Texas, we have the All-State for the high school students. They have the All-State jazz stuff. Um, this year, again, I wrote all the, the music for that. And because of that, I um, I have videos. They moved the date to June 1st. Those videos will be coming out on June 1st, Monday, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I'm anticipating that we get a bunch of high school students next week on this. Maybe I'm wrong, but we'll see. So um, just letting you guys know, that's what I'm anticipating. Um, Richard says, I don't think the big schools are overrated. Miles Davis left Juilliard to play music um, with the Masters. That's true. That's like, that's uh, completely true, yeah. Oh, I see you say, you do think that the schools were, were overrated, yeah. I see. Um, you know, I've heard, so Anthony asked if i ever seen the movie Young Man with a Horn. Um, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet. That, I, I'd like to watch it sometime. But I've heard about it. Anyway, very good, guys. Um, thanks for hanging out again. We'll see you guys next week. And if you have any questions between now and then and would like to get in before the <laughs> before the um, high school students, maybe I'm wrong about this, right? But they, we'll see how it goes. Um, but if you want to get questions in before the, the high school students ask their questions about the pieces, then... Um, Send your questions either through email or um, on my website or something, okay? All right. And we'll, we'll put them first before all the high school stuff. All right? We'll make you guys a, a, a top priority. Thank you, Anthony. We'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. And have a, a blessed week. And, um, and thank you, guys, for hanging out, okay? Um, oh, yeah, so that's right. It's one o'clock over there. All right. God bless you guys. See you next time. Bye.